Laidlo looking like he's up on his feet and, and looking good out of transition. I think he looked very fluid. And right now, Sam Laidlo does not look bound up to me. He looks great. Leader Sam Laidlow is first onto the marathon run as more pro men pour into transition. Rui Van Berg is five and a half minutes behind Sam, and Magnus is just 30 seconds behind him in third. This looks just fine. He uh, doesn't look too stressed out whatsoever. He's just making sure that he goes through the motions in the transition right now. Rudy Von Berg, Sam Laidlow at the moment, the two favourites on the run course here. Don't forget about the big fella, Ditlep. Next athlete coming in right now is Cam Worth from Australia. What a great ride that he had. It's another minute and a half to Cam Worth in fourth. Yeah, and he looks really smooth too. Wow, he does look focused. You can see in his eyes he's not cracked. We know what it feels like when you get off the bike and you, you've spent too many chips as they say. The dueling Frenchman here, we have Chevalier and Mignon on to uh, transition now. Boy, Leon Chevalier looked fantastic coming off the bike. He was bounding off of that bike. Leon Chevalier hits transition in fifth place, just about four minutes behind Campbell. Clement Mignon is in six, right behind him. So the move here from Denmark over the United States, and just like that, Magnus did live. Moving past Rudy Von Berg. Rudy will take the carrot, I'm sure, try to match the pace. Here comes Patrick Longa. He does look fired up, high cadence, yeah. mouth shut, no problems. This guy is just chomping at the bit. Guys, you want some fireworks? They're about to happen because this guy, uh, the two-time Ironman world champion, Patrick Longa, has just jumped off the bike. Patrick Langa is 13 minutes down from the front and is in ninth place. Lange is the most feared runner in the field, but will he have enough real estate to close in on Sam Laidlow? There's no gap that feels comfortable because, like, anything can happen. I was in the best position that I've been ever going into any, so now I'm within the top 10. It only can get better from here, and it's great. comes Jan Ferdino, not the place we thought he'd be, but off he goes. Jan Ferdino enters transition 13 minutes down in 11th place. At that stage, probably mentally, prematurely made the call, you know what, it's been a good journey. Let's finish this off with the spirit of Ironman, which is finishing, finishing a long day, finishing a long event, finishing on a beautiful course, and you know, um, are we taking that time to um, to savor the moment? The 26.2 mile Hoka run course is four fast and flat loops along the famous Promenade des Anglais. Athletes run along the spectator line avenue toward the airport, then turn around and head back toward the finish line to complete one loop. 
With this circuit format, there's no hiding from the competition or the midday heat on this exposed promenade. One of the things that makes this marathon so amazing is that because of the loop course, you're on the Promenade des Anglais. You're on the avenue here in Nice. It's sort of like in Kona, we have Elite Drive, and you're on it for you know a few hundred yards at the very end of the race. This is like Elite Drive the entire way. You have literally thousands of people cheering, and, and the real challenge, of one of the things that makes this seemingly easy marathon course very difficult is that it's so easy to get caught up in the, the enthusiasm and the excitement of the crowd, and all of a sudden you realize, ooh, I cooked myself already, and I'm only 10K into this. You don't want to set off too quickly because you can definitely get a bit excited with the crowds. Like you can't hear anything. You can't hear your breathing. You can't hear your footsteps. It's just like noise and noise and noise. So you want to go fast, but at the same time, you've got like two hours and 40 minutes ahead of you. At 10 miles into the marathon, Sam is holding steady at the front. With the lead that he had built up over the bike ride with his aggressive racing, everyone is wondering which Sam Laidlow is going to run this marathon. The one we saw in Kona a year ago, defying all odds to hang on to second place, or the athlete that we've seen blow up from efforts like this in races many times before. And who would blame him? This year he had a calf tear, and just a few weeks ago, a bout of COVID but he was running with confidence and almost a swagger. I didn't have any poker face plans or anything, and actually in, in Kona, for instance, when the Norwegian hype train came past, I just like stayed in my zone, didn't even look at them. But um, here, both, uh, both Magnus and Rudy, who were the first, obviously, two that were close by, I, I literally like just stared, like, so I could see them coming, I just stared them down, like literally until they were completely off. What did he just do? I don't know if that was the number one or, or a shh. <laughs> I was in a really great position running in second place, and you never know with, with Sam so far. He, is, he has had a tendency towards uh, yeah, bonking a little bit on, or having different uh, problems on the marathon, kind of waiting for him to maybe let me a little bit into, into the race and, and fight for the victory. A marathon is just so long, especially with those out and backs, it's a bit difficult mentally. So you're always gonna have some ups and downs. Um, first 5K was great, then already coming back when Magnus put a bit of a gap on me, I had a bit of a lower energy period. We know this already, it's not a matter of if it gets hot, it's already hot. Yes. 85 degrees at last check, uh, 29 degrees Celsius. Patrick Langa is turning in the run we've been expecting. He's run up into fourth, now 10 minutes from the front. He's taken back three minutes from Sam and seems fueled by the game. It's a good feeling to make them suffer. <laughs> If they know I'm, I'm, I'm coming for them, I think kind of get a little bit nervous and that that's my biggest asset that I can put pressure on those guys. I try to get into their minds and show them, okay, I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> While the pro men's race has moved to the marathon, the age group racers are still tackling this bike course. It's just staggering in both its beauty and difficulty. Following the footsteps of Ironman World Championship finisher Gordon Ramsay, celebrity chef and Top Chef Canada winner 
Dale McKay has come to the World Championship for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The busy restaurateur discovered triathlon as a way to find balance in a lifestyle that can leave little time or space for the pursuit of big endurance goals. Every time I do it, I wonder why I do it, but then I want to do another one right after, so. But like so many fellow amateurs racing the World Championship, he is here on a mission to explore the edges of what he's truly capable of. Today is a big experiment, one that he knows will reveal some new self-truths along the journey of 140.6 miles. Being a chef and, and Iron Man is so similar. It's really about the training, it's the prep. It's everything like the show is service or the race. I just love to compete. I love to be put under pressure, even you know, training for the world championships, knowing that you have to perform and you have to do it. Competitive cooking is the same. There's a certain comfort around it when you know you've done the training. I've never been scared to take massive chances. Why can't I move to England and, and, and work for Gordon Ramsay? Why can't I open up uh, these restaurants? Why can't I do Iron Man? The struggle is what makes it real. It really is about the journey. And without the journey, the, the, the success is really nothing. Okay, let's go find minutes on one risotto, one smash burger, but then right after we're gonna go right into 28. My name is Dale McKay. I'm a Canadian chef. I live in my hometown, Saskatoon, Canada, with my 21-year-old son. I have three restaurants, love to cook, love triathlon. I think it's like the ultimate discipline. You, you really have to get those workouts in. You have to plan, organize. I think the organization I love as well, and it's very much like being a chef. It's, it's all about choice and discipline and, and triathlon. You have to have all those all the time. He doesn't ever do anything without putting his whole self into it. And so it's pretty awesome to see exactly what he can do and everything that he does do on a daily basis. Pretty humbling for to be Dale's brother, to be honest. As soon as Dale picks up with something, it doesn't matter if it's career-wise, cooking, whatever he does, he doesn't do kind of halfway. The way that my dad approaches challenges is very much, there's no other way but to just get through it and to succeed above it. There's no good things in life without challenge. Yeah, I better myself. Young Dale, I think, just always felt like he had something to prove. I did grade one twice, I got held back, and uh, I have dyslexia, and, and uh, I think that's where it originally kind of started from. Also, I've got two older brothers. We've got a fairly colorful past, actually, the <laughs> three of us. Colorful is very uh, Colorful with some uh, unsavory, I guess, <laughs> habits in our, in our younger years. I was a single mom when I was raising Dale, because I never let my children sit around and do nothing. They all had part-time jobs at 14. If you want something, you work for it. If Dale wants it, he'll have it. He'll get it. That's who he is. My mom made us really independent people, me and my brothers. I was doing a lot of bad stuff, and my mom gave me an ultimatum, and so I tried to be tough, and, and I bought a, a one-way ticket to, to Vancouver. I actually got given a VHS, and it was a documentary that Gordon Ramsay had done for the BBC, and I just thought, if I can become a chef there, I can work anywhere in the world, and I can really prove myself. And three weeks later, I moved to England. When he was 19, he said, well, I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to go and work for Gordon Ramsay. I said, yeah, this kid's got dreams, eh? And uh, I thought, ah, he'll be back within three months. Well, he was gone for six years. I just showed up, and it, it worked out, but purely because of hard work. All I did was just cook and sleep, cook and sleep, and cook and sleep. He was like the most disciplined person I could possibly imagine being around, and I needed that in my life. Must be three souffles, one chocolate. I won Top Chef Canada season one. I love doing, you know, food television. I, I and I love to compete more than anything else. Uh, Top Chef Canada was, you know, about 12 years ago now. Aiden was only eight years old. I am a single father. There's nothing more that I want is is to win for him. Dale, you are Canada's Top Chef. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. Good job, buddy. He ran out, and we ran towards each other. I picked him up out of the air, and it was easily something we'll never forget. <sighs> being a single parent, it's a, it's a hard job, but I think it's, I mean, being a parent is the best. He's my absolute mentor and my idol. I want to grow up and, and be like my dad, even half of who he is, absolutely.
I've never considered myself athletic, and that's part of the reason why I got in triathlon. This is gonna be one of the biggest things I could do out of my comfort zone ever. I would say he is the quintessential Ironman. Yeah. Like, I mean, now that he's doing it, it makes sense. I mean, for me, I'm just super proud of him. I just opened up a new restaurant, and so, which means I'm in the kitchen a lot more. I still manage to fit all my training in, because I think, you know, when you prioritize things that you love, they can all fit in. I often think about the kid in grade one that got held back. When you're in that position, you think, am I ever gonna be good at anything? I really do think anything is possible. Pressure is a gift, you know? It's not just the swim, bike, run, you're learning. You're just learning to be a, a better, rounded person. Hey, mate. How you doing? Oh, my lord, John, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. It's been a long time. I've always watched Gordon, obviously, since I've, you know, worked with him for so many years. To know that, you know, he's done Ironman, uh, it makes me want to do even better. It definitely makes me want to beat his time, for sure. You're in for a, an amazing day. And honestly, the swim for me was the best bit because, you know, from a chef's point of view, every time I saw fish, I started conceptualizing dishes. <laughs> and that would be I use so many of the things that I learned from him in outside of cooking and in life. And I would say I've applied those exact things that I've learned from him in triathlon training. You're so similar to myself. You're hard on yourself because of the nature of your career and what you strive for. So congratulate yourself, okay? You're there for a reason. Well, I appreciate that. I, t I appreciate you taking the time and, and talking to me about it and stuff. And hopefully I'll see you in Kona next year, right? Mate, um, <laughs> I would love to. Uh, uh, I'm going to wish deal. you the very best of luck. I'll be tracking you. As they say in French, bouche ton cul. Move your ass! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it I think greatness is different for everyone, and I think that's why triathlon is so important to me now, too, is that I see it as another path to my greatness. If you would have told me three years ago, that I was going to be at the Ironman World Championships with my family and, and, and doing this, I probably wouldn't believe you. I don't think anyone would believe you. I was a heavy smoker and I wasn't into this, and, and now it's, it's all I think about.
position, the final turn down Polani. This is Lucy Charles. The race clock has hit five hours and 30 minutes in the women's race, and Lucy Charles is still alone at the front as she starts the marathon. When I get off the bike and start thinking about the run, I never think, hey, it's a full marathon here. Like, I try not to do that. I really do try and break it down. Go get them, girl, because it is now time uh, that 26.2 mile run, Didi, and stop the clock here. We'll get you those official uh, Oahu element splits soon enough, but Lucy, a little bit bound up, as we all would be hitting that carpet. Absolutely, and our great volunteer. And out she goes. Her closest chaser, Taylor Nib, is more than three and a half minutes back. There it is, the yellow tin. Yeah, folks, get ready. Taylor gave up the point. I'm coming in. Be ready. I don't know how my body will respond, especially to the distance and the conditions, but I think this is a course where there is a history, and you see the people, some of the greats have even struggled on certain days. So it's also, you just, you see that it can, like, anyone is susceptible here. Taylor Nib feet her out of the shoes as she makes her way to the dismount line in second place. The smile tells you a lot, right? It gets, tells you presence of mind. It tells you her fueling has been good. She's, she's the blood sugar. With Taylor finish. making her marathon debut here, no one really knows what's in store for this foot race. Behind Taylor, Laura Phillip has made up a ton of positions on the bike, but is nearly seven minutes back. Laura is also one of the best runners in the field. Entering transition 11 and a half minutes behind Lucy, Daniela Reef has broken from the usual script of absolutely dominating the back half of the bike ride to start this marathon in a good position. In sixth place, her work is cut out for her. I used to have bad days also in early years, but I could cover it better because I was just really good. <laughs> Where now I'm still good, but the others got much better. So I can't get away with an average day because the competition is just too hard. Annie Hogg starts the run in seventh place, 12 minutes off the pace. She has some of the fastest runs on this course, but she would need her career best and some faltering from Lucy Charles Barkley to have a chance at the win. When I jump off the bike, the feeling for my body is just how the heck can I run a marathon? And to be honest, I feel I, the walk through transition was like, I feel like an elephant, but I try not to worry too much about it because I think everyone will hurt after the bike ride. And I always say to myself, I give myself the first 5K to get into a rhythm and then we will judge. Chelsea came off the bike in 20th place. That's a long, long way from where she wants to be, but don't ever count this woman out. She has the strength and pure grit it takes to do something special. When I get off the bike, I think it's time to go to work. I love to beat people and I love to chase them down. The 26.2 mile Hoka run course leads out of transition near the pier and down the famous Ali'i Drive before taking athletes out onto the Queen Kahamanu Highway. They'll enter the Natural Energy Lab, the most notorious part of the course, do a short out and back section and then head back onto the Queen K towards town. They'll dip down onto Ali'i Drive again before heading to one of the most iconic finish line shoots in all of endurance sport. Lucy came off of the bike ride with almost four minutes over her closest competitor, Taylor Nip. A gap that will be encouraging, but Lucy knows anything can happen on this run and that she needs extreme focus, even in these early stages. On Alihi, the energy is amazing, but everyone was screaming at me, Lucy, this is your day, and I was like, this is way too early to be saying this. I almost didn't want to hear it. I was confident, but at the same time, I was actually having a really horrible time at the start of that marathon. So I was playing the ultimate poker face of, I thought I'm gonna make everyone think I feel really good. I'm gonna be like smiling and running, but inside I was really suffering. Taylor Nib has much more experience than her 25 years would show. 
but she'd never attempted a marathon before. Well, now is her chance. And with seven minutes on third place, she's in a great position to finish on the podium in her first ever Kona. I was actually excited for the run. And like, I like to do challenging things and I like to do things that scare me a little bit. I think that that brings out the best of me. And so, but I actually didn't let myself think about it. I was just like, okay, one step at a time. I don't know where I should go now. We'll just go straight. Because over there is really cool. I feel like she's going to be like the next superstar. She's super talented, already has two world titles on, uh, in her, you know, her pocket. And uh, she's very determined to, to train hard and be focused. And I think she has a bright future. She's one of the best athletes in the world. Is she one of the best athletes at Ironman? We don't know yet. Could she be? Yes. I think she has a very interesting character and she definitely adds a dynamic to the race. She speaks her mind. This is more like if you do something wrong in the swim, like you're going to be walking in the run. And so it's like, it's a completely different mindset of like, it's more of like a don't mess this up, then you need to be in this position. Wait, you've never run a marathon? No. <laughs> My longest run is 18.92 miles, if people are curious. I know a lot of people will predict that she'll blow up on Saturday, and she might. But if I was going to bet on a rookie, I think I would bet on Taylor. The first time Miles on the drive like through town, there's so many spectators, and you're like, I feel amazing. This is so easy. I could run this all day. I'm going to win. And then you hit like 10 miles you and on the Queen K, and you're by yourself, and it's not easy anymore. Regardless if you're an elite pro or an age group athlete, the Kona course will have every single racer at multiple points in the day question their why. Why attempt these long distances in these grueling conditions? Why invite such physical and mental discomfort? Why venture so beyond your comfort zone? It took Yulia Azapardi four days to reach Kailua Kona from her native Ukraine. With no flights departing Ukraine since the war began, the only option was to travel over a thousand kilometers to a border and then fly from Warsaw, Poland. Yulia says the war has made her more determined than ever to live her life to the fullest. And triathlon is a big part of that commitment. For some, there's something to prove to themselves, to others. Maybe if you're like age group racer Nadine Hunt, it's that and more. Nadine is here in Kona to make a statement about her own potential, but she's also here to blaze a path for others to follow as the first First Nations woman from Australia to complete the Ironman World Championship. You can't be it if you can't see it. Those words are the driving force for Nadine in these lava fields. I grew up around some negative things, you know, and, and our Indigenous communities, unfortunately, have, have been through a lot of trauma and, and a lot of really negative things that are normalised. And if I can show other First Nations people what our normal is, and that's to be strong, resilient and healthy, they're going to come into these new healthy cycles of norm where people aren't telling them what type of negative statistic they are. That they can see through their mothers, fathers, brothers, what, what we are, and that's strong. I'm Nadine Hunt, a Kanju, and I am a Lug woman from the Kukugal Nations, and I am the first First Nations woman from Australia to do the Ironman World Championships. <laughs> So I was born and raised in Cairns in far north Queensland in Australia, but have family roots to the Torres Strait Islands and also Cape York, and had a very strong influence of the Yam Island culture up in the Torres Straits growing up through my grandfather's lineage. It was very much that family village type of upbringing. 
it's like, it's just in our blood to move. It's in our blood to play sports, to be out there. You know, back in the day we were hunters and gatherers and I just feel like there's something in our genetics that we're supposed to move. And when we do, we're quite good at it. You know, sport was very influential in my life. I started playing soccer when I was about six or seven. Probably didn't stop until I was in my early 30s. We were a very active family. We either went camping or, you know, it was back in the days when you, you didn't have to be home until the sun was down. Back in 2011, I applied for a project called the Indigenous Marathon Project. It was very new and they were kind of looking for Indigenous men and women age 18 to 30 to use the marathon to create real life role models. Went from zero running to running a marathon in a six month period, ran the New York Marathon, which someone that had really never left Cairns and didn't have a passport and never been overseas and never run those distances, it, it really did transform my life. I think I came back from completing that program, realizing that I was capable of so much more than I gave myself credit for. And then it wasn't until I had my son back in 2018 and ran a marathon 10 months postpartum and I just hated running. Like it, it was too hard. My body had changed and my body didn't like it and so stopped. And that's kind of when Trimob and, and Nat Heath was starting to spark things with Trimob that I was kind of intrigued with what this was about. And I guess my first step into getting into triathlon was teaming up with two other Indigenous runners in Cairns that were graduates from IMP to do a relay for the Cairns 70.3. And then somehow ended up signing up for a triathlon coaching block. <laughs> and yeah, and turned up to the pool and realised I could barely swim 50 metres and <laughs> thought, what am I doing? But yeah, like that was in 2021. TribeMob is a First Nations organisation um, empowering our mob through the sport of triathlon. And we want to use the sport to, to strengthen, you know, the mind, the body and the spirit. Like it's not just about the sport, it's so much more. It has the ongoing effects mentally and spiritually. And triathlon's huge in Australia and it's really growing as a sport, but for some reason it has this smallest participation of First Nations people. I think it's a huge deal. It's, it's a really big deal for TriMob, for Nadine, obviously, for Nat, and, and for triathlon in Australia. Yeah, I think it's really important to have role models like her in our community. It really um, pushes us. Like on those days that we want to stay in, stay at home, we know that she's going to be here. So we feel that, yeah, what's our excuse? Um, one thing that Nadine's taught us is that if you have the knowledge, to share the knowledge after seven years of being under Nadine's wings um, as an athlete and her being my coach, uh, I've learned so much, you know, um, how to be community involved, how to, uh, a lot more confidence in myself and my running and um, stepping outside, you know, my comfort zones and, and just going for it. I do like to show other women what is possible. And, and that we can establish ourselves in the professional field, we can have home life and we can have goals and dreams. And we don't have to pick and choose between those three or the two or, or whatever it may be. That if we have the right guidance and the right support, that, that we can tick every single box because everyone else can. So, so why can't mothers or why can't women? It's important to showcase because women have this remarkable capacity to endure. Like, I feel like endurance sports is what we're built to do. She's a perfect example of the ripple effect. What she's done and continues to do um, for her people. Like, I never would have thought a year ago I'd complete an Ironman and then 12 months later go to Kona. And so everything I've done when I've started this sport has been to amplify the strength of women and in particular mums. And especially as a First Nations mum, because we do 
feel guilty for wanting to put herself first and, and that frustrates the hell out of me. Why hasn't there been someone before me? How is it that we're in 2023 and I'm the first? I'm just so incredibly proud of just being here and getting to this point that whatever happens in Kona is, is a privilege. Like just getting to that start line and being able to really capture the spirit and the essence of the people over there and then think about my people back home and all the sacrifices. She's just a super woman in my eyes and I'm just so proud of her. And I can't wait for the big day to witness my niece as the first Indigenous woman, Torres Strait, representing Torres Strait, representing Gunganji, Yedinji people, uh, Kanji, Southern Kanji people, right up to Kurkalkal, Central Island, Torres Strait, Yam Island, my dad's place. Yeah, I, I don't think much is going to compare to it and, it, and it's going to be an experience that is certainly going to change my life forever, but I think something that I'm going to walk away from a hell of a lot stronger than I ever thought I was.